Chapter 24, The Five-Part Ministry of Joseph Smith, The Secret History of Mormonism. In previous chapters, we've identified the grand missing piece of the prophet puzzle by matching up Joseph Smith with the ancient prophecies that speak of a latter-day servant of the Lord that first brings forth the law, builds a temple, and does much good. Following that, he offers an intercessory atonement offering that prevents latter-day Israel from being wiped off the face of the earth. Because of this intercessory offering, the servant takes the sins of apostate Israel upon himself and begins acting out the sins. According to a prophecy in 2 Samuel 7, the Davidic servant commits iniquity and is therefore chastened by the rod of man. Understanding Joseph's role as an intercessory atonement offering is critical to understanding many of the bizarre things that happened during Joseph's ministry. We have also addressed many other things that are essential in making sense out of Joseph's public ministry and the LDS Restoration Movement. We have observed that the Gentile converts to the restored church in the Kirtland era were largely from the ancient kingdom of Israel, while the converts that began flowing into Nauvoo and across the Great Waters a decade later are referred to by Christ as the House of Israel. In the prophecy he gave in 3 Nephi 16, Drilling down a little deeper, it becomes apparent that many of these Latter-day Jews that converted to the restored gospel were from the tribe of Judah and the ancient kingdom of Judah. We observed how the restored Gentile church represents the literal fulfillment of the parable of the twelve virgins, and we can now see why the bridegroom tarried and did not make his appearance at the appointed time of September 11, 1836. Prior to that, he did come as a thief in the night to his temple with a blessing and a cursing. According to the parable of the three watches, he will come once more in secret during the third watch prior to his final coming in glory. One of the remarkable things we've reviewed is the fact that the kingdom of God and the fullness of the priesthood gospel was on the earth for exactly three and a half years before it went back into the wilderness. Before the church of God fled back into the wilderness, a great intercession was accomplished by Joseph Smith and one who is like Moses. After the Gentile church rejected the fullness of the gospel, Joseph Smith publicly declared that God had revealed to him that something new must be done for the salvation of the church, resulting in the establishment of foreign missions. When the dispensation of the gospel of Abraham was secretly ushered in, the tra trajectory of the church greatly changed as the ancient kingdom of Israel was reestablished. All of this makes possible for us to create and document a meaningful and cohesive narrative in conjunction with the timeline of Joseph Smith's ministry, which we shall now do. An understanding of the prophetic, biblical profile of Joseph Smith is essential for those wanting to understand his life, specifically, and early history of Mormonism generally. It provides a lens with which to accurately make sense of the apparent inconsistencies in his ministry. A firm understanding of the five primary ancient prophecies were covered in chapters 3 through 5, along with approximately 50 related ancillary prophecies, are critical to understanding the secretive na narrative behind the many controversial historical events that took place in the Latter-day Restoration Movement. If the reader has any doubts about the prophetic interpretations provided, they are encouraged to do their own extensive study on the subject, since the information is foundational to the suppositions provided in this book. Biblical prophecy scholars typically promote one of two theories as to whom the prophecy in 2 Samuel 7 is referring. They virtually always postulate Christ or Solomon. My contention is that, while Christ and Solomon bo might both be considered vague, shadow, or typological fulfillments, neither can possibly qualify as the literal fulfillment of the Latter-day Prophet, to which Nathan referred. One must either discount or negate the significant details of the prophecy and rest the scriptures to arrive at such interpretations. The profile fits Joseph Smith explicitly and singularly. Let's briefly recap the historical events concerning Joseph Smith that mirror the prophetic narrative given by the prophet Nathan. Number 1. Joseph Smith appointed the place for the gathering of Israel by revelation. According to the prophecies he brought forth, as well as ancient prophecies, he'll eventually preside over the gathering. 2. Joseph Smith was a literal descendant of King David and was used by God to restore biblical Christianity and to establish the kingdom of God on earth. 3. Joseph Smith built the house of the Lord. Although magnificent secret things took place in the edifice, we have the more sure word of prophecy that it will yet play a significant role in the marvelous works spoken of by Isaiah. Number 4. 
Joseph Smith obtained the status of son. He was sealed up and had his name put into the book of the names of the sanctified. He was sealed up to eternal life, calling an election, enabling himself to offer a temporal atonement offering, much like the atonement offering that Moses provided for ancient Israel. 5. After those events, Joseph Smith transgressed against the law of God that he had been instrumental in bringing forth. This is because of his intercessory atonement offering that caused the eyes of the seer to be covered. 6. Joseph Smith was publicly chastened by a member of his own first presidency and ultimately murdered by angry men for a multitude of reasons. One of the primary incentives to set the wheels in motion was his secret practice of polygamy. Number 7. According to modern revelation, Joseph Smith, like Moses of old, retained the mercy of God and retained the keys of the kingdom in this world and in the world to come. The possibility of pure coincidence is beyond remote. In my opinion, the chances of these events being coincidental in matching up exactly with a prophecy in, by Nathan in 2 Samuel 7 are beyond remote. Nevertheless, the interpretation of the mysterious prophecy is not just a logical, intellectual pursuit. I would submit that no historic figure matches the profile given in 2 Samuel 7 as close as Joseph Smith, if at all. A Review of Mysterious Declarations and Historical Events In this chapter, we will now review and catalog the secretive five-part ministry of Joseph Smith that makes sense of this bizarre inconsistencies between the life and teachings of Joseph Smith during his early Kirtland ministry compared to the later years of his ministry. Questionable major events pertaining to this ministry, which all took place after the rejection of the fullness of the gospel in 1834, include a possible indiscretion with Fanny Alger, which most credible historians place somewhere between 1835 and 36, the less than inspired idea for a bank in late 1836, which failed by November of 1837, providing the major impetus for a massive apostasy bringing the Kirtland era to an end. In their next stop in Far West, we have the ill-fated Mormon War and the emergence of the Danites, which Joseph appears to have condoned. In Nauvoo, the infiltration of masonry, the heretical doctrine of spiritual wife, celestial polygamy, and the blasphemous King Follett Discourse, which taught that God the Father was not from everlasting to everlasting, contrary to what the Bible, Book of Mormon, and Doctrine and Covenants had revealed. As we evaluate each of the mysterious and secretive events during these years, I would argue that the only plausible answer to the apparent dilemmas, controversies, and contradictions posed by Joseph Smith's erratic teachings and behavior during the later years of his ministry is found in the literal fulfillment of the prophetic atonement statute and prophecy in 2 Samuel 7. Much of the history of Mormonism has been altered or deleted in the official history of the church. Nevertheless, it's truly amazing how much critical information remains in the official history which testifies of the Latter-day Apostasy, the different phases of Joseph's ministry, the doctrine of the Three Watches, and the literal fulfillment of the prophecy embedded in the Atonement Statute. Those who fled from Nauvoo to Utah seemed to be, or at least acted as if, they were oblivious to the reality of the apostasy in which they were entrenched. They did not understand Joseph Smith's role in providing an intercessory offering or the doctrine of the three watches. They did not understand that Joseph retained the keys of the kingdom, but left the oracles by those that received them were to be judged. They simply did not comprehend the significance of the many of the events and statements documented in the official history of the church. Many of the significant historical events were actually left in the official history and publications simply because they were not comprehended. Additionally, modern revelation, which is canonized and therefore not easily discarded, sheds light on many of these issues as well. Using the official history of the church, some additional credible historical sources, and modern revelation, I'm providing a brief chronological listing of events and pronouncements below. This listing provides some very important defining moments and trigger dates that took place in the apostasy of the restored church between 1828 and 1844. We will next review a partial summary of some of the mysterious revelatory declarations and historical events not generally highlighted in the official histories of the Mormon Church. Most Mormons are unfamiliar with many of them, or they disregard them as inconsequential. Those who are oblivious to the events 
or their significance are missing out on the historical keys to understanding the hidden storyline behind the official one marketed by LDS Inc. If the reader does not see a pattern embedded within the listing below, it's hoped that by the end of this chapter, or at least by the end of the book, all these strange declarations and or events will make sense and will be recon reconstructed in the mind of the reader into a coherent and credible storyline. Partial Listing of Prophetic Declarations and Historical Events, March of 1829. God foretells that he will deliver the saints over to Satan at a future time if they don't repent and have a reformation. Next, February of 1831, the saints are given the law of consecration. They eventually enter into a covenant and ultimately fail in their attempt at the consecration. Next, February 1831, the Lord reveals the law of succession and declares that Joseph will never have a successor until the Lord takes him, unless he transgresses. It declares that if he should need a successor, he will be the one to name a successor by revelation. The prophecy begins to be fulfilled a decade later in 1841, when the Lord calls Hiram to be the co-president of the church with Joseph. The prophecy is completed shortly thereafter when Joseph resigns as the prophet of the church, leaving Hiram as the sole prophet of the church, and declares that he will no longer prophesy for the church, and that the church must acknowledge his brother Hiram as the prophet of the church. <clears throat> okay, the next one is in June of 1831. The third and highest grand order of priesthood is revealed and bestowed on 23 men at a special conference at the Morley Farm. Next bullet point, June 1831, the man of sin is revealed at the special conference of the Morley Farm in which the Melchizedek priesthood is restored in fulfillment of 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 3. This provides the prophetic marker which after, see, after which the falling away can occur. September 11, 1831, the Lord identifies September 11 of 1836 as the drop-dead date for the redemption of Zion and promises that Kirtland will be a stronghold for the five years leading up to that date. Shortly thereafter, apostasy erupts primarily as a result of the Kirtland Safety Society fiasco. Many of the saints consider Joseph Smith to be a fallen or a false prophet, and many of the foundational members and leaders of the church leave. Next point, April of 1834, the Lord announced that, quote, the covenants, brackets, had been, end of brackets, broken through transgression. Next, May of 1834, within days of God's declaration that some of his servants had failed to keep the commandment of consecration and would be cursed, the name of Christ is taken out of the church by conference vote, without any explanation provided in the conference notes. Next bullet point. June of 1834. Because of transgression, the church is told to wait for a little season of chastisement. They are informed that the elders must receive the endowment of power from on high before they can reinstate the law of consecration and live the laws of Zion. Next, June, also June of 1834, 15 men are called and chosen per section 105, verses 35 through 37. Many of them are specifically told in the Revelation that at the appointed time, they would gather up the strength of God's house as prophesied in the parable of the redemption of Zion, D&C 101. Next, November 1834, Joseph and Oliver enter, enter into a covenant of tithing for the continuation of blessings. This appears to be a last-ditch effort for Joseph and Oliver to avoid the consequences related to the group failure to live consecration. The Lord had warned that the manifestations of his spirit would be withheld if the covenant of consecration was broken. Remarkably, the transaction enabled the saints to complete the Kirtland Temple and for Joseph and Oliver to receive the secret vision behind the veil in April of 1836. Next, in 1835, Joseph Smith intervenes in the stewardship given to Oliver Cowdery and Martin Harris and replaces their first choices of Phineas Young to the Quorum of the Twelve with his own brother, William Smith. Next, March of 1836, the First Presidency waits on the Lord in the Holy of Holies to know if it's time for them to redeem Zion. It is unclear from the journal entries whether the answer of no came in the form of a revelation or in the fact that no revelation came at all. March of 1836. 
The anticipated endowment of power and the ushering in of the dispensation of the fullness of times does not materi materialize during the solemn assembly. April of 1836. Christ comes secretly to his temple, with a blessing followed by a cursing. The dispensation of the gospel of Abraham is secretly ushered in, instead of the dispensation of the fullness of times. September of 1836. At the appointed deadline of September 11, 1836, the saints had failed to consecrate and redeem Zion. Ironically, the saints take a turn in the opposite direction of having all things in common, like the New Testament saints. At this time, the Kirtland Safety Society banking venture is suggested and ultimately becomes a huge financial disaster, leading to another wave of apostasy. Next, in September of 1836, Parley Pratt receives a revelation that the gospel will be taken from the Gentiles to the nations. Joseph and Sidney are forced to flee from Kirtland. Next, 1837, Joseph Smith declares that God has revealed to him that, quote, something new must be done for the salvation of the church, end of quote, resulting in the establishment of foreign missions. Next, April of 1839, in fulfillment of a commandment given in section 18 of the DNC, the Quorum of the Twelve secretly meet late at night under the cover of darkness at the Far West Temple lot to fulfill the commandment and embark on their foreign missions. Next, God announces that all flesh has become corrupt. Next, January of 1841, the succession prophecy in section 43 is fulfilled when Joseph Smith names his brother Hiram as the co-president of the church and then personally resigns as the prophet within a few years. October of 1841. Joseph announces that baptisms for the dead are no longer allowed outside the unfinished temple and that no more general conferences will be allowed until the temple is finished. According to the testimony of Lyman White, Joseph was acknowledging that the church had been rejected with their dead. Next, August of 1843, Hiram outs his brother Joseph and his secret polygamy doctrine by presenting the polygamy revelation to the Nauvoo High Council on August 12, 1843, and telling them they must accept it or be damned. June of 1844, President Law and Associates published the Expositor, publicly revealing Joseph's secret practice of polygamy and the secret spiritual wife doctrine. William Law and his associates invite the saints to have a reformation and return to the foundational principles of the gospel. This marks the fulfillment of the prophecy given in section 4 of the Book of Commandments, given back in 1829. Next, June of 1844, Joseph Smith commands his associates to destroy the minutes of the Council of Fifty, which documents the fact that Joseph Smith had himself anointed as the King of Israel. Also in June of 1844, Joseph Smith tells members of the Quorum of the Anointed and sent a letter to the Twelve Apostles who were on political missions campaigning for Joseph's presidential campaign, telling them to destroy their endowment garments. This was a rather dubious directive, given the fact that the garments were supposed to provide protection. And then last bullet point, in fulfillment of the prophecy in 2 Samuel 7, Joseph Smith is chastened by the rod of men because of iniquity while awaiting to be tried on charges of treason. And then there's, of course, footnotes for all of those um, bullet points. The above listing of key historical events is quite incomplete, but they provide a very clear pattern. All of the above revelatory declarations and associated historical events provide hugely significant interpretive keys to understanding the true history of the restored church and what actually took place during the ministry of Joseph Smith. Nevertheless, few of them are ever given any substantive, substantive attention in the official church history or correlated lesson manuals of the modern Mormon church because they're not perceived to be faith-promoting. For this reason, the vast majority of Mormons are largely unfamiliar with these events. Hence, they constitute many of the key components pertaining to what I refer to as the secret history of Mormonism. I would suggest, however, that once revealed and once understood in the proper context, they provide a contextual outline of what really took place during the extremely controversial ministry of Joseph Smith. Although they shine a bright light on some of the false claims made by modern Mormonism, in my opinion, they become extremely faith-promoting. They give prophetic legitimacy to the brief restoration of New Testament Christianity and the fullness of the gospel before it fled back into the wilderness and to the biblical role that Joseph Smith played. 
the rejection followed by opportunity for repentance. Motif 3, Nephi 16. Before we divide the ministry of Joseph Smith into five parts, we're going to look at the prophetic rejection of the gospel followed by repentance, motif in 3 Nephi. The Book of Mormon offers an apparent discrepancy regarding the response of the Gentiles to the restored gospel. Some prophecies characterize the Gentiles as rejecting the fullness of the gospel, while others depict the Gentiles as repenting and accepting the fullness. The truth is that both scenarios are accurate, but they happen during different periods of time. Sadly, many people get the chronology of the two events wrong. Many Book of Mormon students falsely assume that the Gentiles initially repent and accept the gospel during Joseph Smith's ministry and then many generations later, during the final generation, the Gentiles reject the gospel. I'm going to suggest that the chronology of those events is reversed. It's actually during Joseph's ministry in the second watch that the Gentiles reject the fullness followed by a repentance and acceptance of the gospel many generations later during the third watch. One of the most profound and succinct interpretive keys to understanding the secret history of Mormonism and what really took place during Joseph Smith's ministry is contained in a prophecy that Christ gave in 3 Nephi 16 verses 10 through 13. In these four verses, the Lord reveals an eight-point scenario that was to take place during Joseph's ministry in the second watch, all within a decade. Christ prophesies that the Gentiles will initially reject the gospel. Quote, and thus commandeth the Father that I should say unto you, At that day, when the Gentiles shall sin against my gospel, and shall reject the fullness of my gospel, and shall be lifted up in the pride of their hearts above all nations, and above all the people of the whole earth, and shall be filled with all manner of lyings and deceits and of mischiefs, and all manner of hypocrisy and murders and priestcrafts and whoredoms, and of secret abominations, and if they shall do all those things, and shall reject the fullness of my gospel, behold, saith the Father, I will bring the fullness of my gospel from among them. And then will I remember my covenant which I have made unto my people, O house of Israel, and I will bring my gospel unto them. And I will show unto thee, O house of Israel, that the Gentiles shall not have power over you. But I will remember my covenant unto you, O house of Israel, and ye shall come unto the knowledge of the fullness of my gospel. But if the Gentiles will repent and return unto me, saith the Father, behold, they shall be numbered among my people, O house of Israel. End of quote. Okay, so the eight-part scenario outlined in the above prophecy is itemized as follows. Okay, number one. The Gentiles reject the fullness of the gospel. 2. The Lord brings the fullness of the gospel from among the Gentiles. 3. The Gentiles are lifted up in the pride of their hearts. 4. God remembers his covenant with the house of Israel. 5. The Lord brings the gospel to the house of Israel. 6. The house of Israel is given the knowledge of the fullness of the gospel. 7. The Gentiles do not have power over the house of Israel. 8. If the Gentiles repent, they shall be numbered among the house of Israel. Okay, so remarkably, the eight-point synopsis of Christ's prophecy above can be identified and easily documented in the history and related prophecies of the LDS Restoration Movement. Gentiles versus House of Israel. Contrary to popular belief, popular belief among LDS prophecy scholars, not all the Caucasian inhabitants of America are defined as the Gentiles in the Book of Mormon. The very first time the word Gentile is used in the Book of Mormon is in 1 Nephi 10. The following passage provides clarification, quote, And after the house of Israel should be scattered, they should be gathered together again, or in fine, after the Gentiles had received the fullness of the gospel, the natural branches of the olive tree or the remnants of the house of Israel should be grafted in, or come to the knowledge of the true Messiah, their Lord and their Redeemer, end of quote. The above verse makes it clear that the term house of Israel that are grafted in and come to a knowledge of the true Messiah directly after the Gentiles have received the fullness of the gospel is referring to multiple branches or remnants of Israel, not just the descendants of Lehi. This is a grand key to understand the prophecy in 3 Nephi 16. Clearly the house of Israel of which Christ speaks and to whom the gospel is taken is not referring exclusively to the Lamanites. Indeed, the Lamanites collectively rejected the gospel when it was taken to them shortly after the church was restored. It was the successful foreign missions in Great Britain that grafted remnants of the house of Israel into the olive tree. 
Mormon 5 confirms that the gospel is not taken to the house of Israel until after the seed of Lehi is scattered by the Gentiles. I would suggest that the term Gentile in the Book of Mormon had specific reference to the first wave of immigrant pilgrims and their descendants who, according to the Book of Mormon, came out of captivity. This branch of Israel were remnants of the ancient Kingdom of Israel that had mingled among the Gentiles' nations. The founding fathers of Mormonism were among these Gentiles spoken of in the Book of Mormon. In 1 Nephi 13, we're informed that the Gentiles went forth out of captivity upon the many waters. It was primarily the early Gentile pilgrims and those who followed them shortly thereafter who obtained the land for their inheritance. It was primarily the descendants of these early Gentile pilgrims who crossed the waters and would scatter and smite the Lamanites. The Book of Mormon separates these Gentiles into two groups, the believing Gentiles and the non-believing Gentiles. Sadly, even the believing Gentiles stumble exceedingly after receiving the Book of Mormon, according to the Book of Mormon. Textbook examples of the Gentiles from pilgrim and post-pilgrim stock would have been the early converts to the church, such as Smith, Whitmer, Johnson, and Cowdery families, and the majority of those who were gathered into the church during the early Kirtland era. The three witnesses, the eight witnesses, and those referred to as the first laborers of the last kingdom, etc., were Gentiles. In essence, all or most of the 23 elders who were called to be high priests in June of 1831 were of Gentile stock. Conversely, when the Book of Mormon refers to the house of Israel in 1st Nephi 10 and 3rd Nephi 16 and Mormon 5 and other places, it refers generally to the scattered remnants of the ancient kingdom of Judah, sometimes referred to as Jews, as well as other branches or remnants of Israel, who generally migrated to America at a much later time although there are undoubtedly some exceptions to the rule. According to ancient and modern prophecy, the Spirit of God began inspiring people to come to the land of opportunity. Among this general group who felt a desire to come to America was a subcategory of people who were being converted to the restored gospel. Converts to the church whose families had migrated to America within recent generations and those migrating as the express result of their conversions were referred to in the Book of Mormon as the House of Israel. I believe many of these people were from the ancient kingdom of Judah. In other chapters of the Book of Mormon, these people migrating to America to join the church are also referred to as Jews. This topic is covered in greater detail in other chapters. People from Great Britain who had moved to Canada would very possibly have been classified by the Book of Mormon as House of Israel rather than Gentile, although there probably were Gentiles mingled among this second gathering as well. Interestingly, everyone in the church could now be gen generally referred to as a Gentile, since we have all mingled during the last four generations. Converts such as Joseph Fielding and his sister Mary, who came from Britain to Nauvoo during the Nauvoo era, are most likely classified in the Book of Mormon as House of Israel and not Gentile. This would have long-reaching effects on the Utah faction of the Restoration Saints because Hiram Smith would marry Mary Fielding after his first wife died. Future leaders of the LDS Church descending from Hiram Smith and Mary Fielding, including two presidents of the church, Joseph F. Smith and Joseph Fielding Smith, might more accurately be classified in the Book of Mormon as being from the House of Israel rather than from the Gentiles if one considers their matriarchal line, as is customary in Judaism. This distinction between Gentile and House of Israel is essential in understanding this cryptic prophecy. This also has significant ramifications relating to the House of David and the restoration of the children of Judah to the lands of their inheritance, as mentioned in section 109. As we review the five-part ministry of Joseph Smith, it will become evident that the fullness of the gospel was only on the earth for a very short period of time before the Gentile church collectively rejected it. Here's a brief response to each of the above points as I believe they relate to events within Joseph Smith's ministry. Eight points covered in Christ's prophecy in 3 Nephi 16. So just covering them in greater detail than we did in the, um, the eight parts in the earlier um, diagram. One, the Gentiles reject the fullness of the gospel. Section 124 of the Doctrine and Covenants revealed that by the time the saints migrated to Nauvoo, the fullness of the priesthood and therefore the fullness of the gospel had been taken from them. 
Evidence that the Gentiles rejected the fullness of the gospel is provided by the fact that the Lord condemned the leaders and members of the Gentile church, took his name out of the name of the church, and released the Gentile saints from living the required laws of Zion for a little season. All of these events took place during or before the year of 1834. Number two, the Lord brings the fullness of the gospel from among the Gentiles. Chronologically speaking, this declaration is quite significant. It informs us that the fullness of the gospel is taken from the Gentile saints before the Lord takes the gospel and the knowledge of the fullness of the gospel to the house of Israel. Notice that while the Lord brings the gospel to the house of Israel, they only get a knowledge of the fullness of the gospel. Remarkably, the fullness was rejected in or before 1834, and the dispensation of the gospel of Abraham would not be secretly ushered in until 1836. Shortly after that, Joseph would establish foreign missions, announcing that something new must be done for the salvation of the church, which resulted in the gospel being taken to the house of Israel. Number three, the Gentiles are lifted up in the pride of their hearts. They've always been critics of the prophet Joseph Smith, who have found fault with him practically from the minute he came out of the womb. During the 30 plus years that I've been studying Joseph's life, I found precious little to throw rocks at up until the fullness of the gospel was rejected by the saints in 1834. Up to that point in time, Joseph's imperfections, in my opinion, can pretty much be classified as the human condition from which we all suffer. My personal study has led me to the conclusion that very little credible evidence exists to impugn the character of Joseph Smith prior to the year 1834, when the saints failed to live consecration. The name of Christ was mysteriously taken out of the name of the church, and the Lord declared that the leaders and members of the church were under condemnation and needed to have a reformation. Nevertheless, that year represents a tipping point when Joseph Smith's character began experiencing a dynamic change. I believe credible historians have provided a plethora of documentation to show that Joseph Smith specifically, and the church, general church membership generally, began showing some very questionable fruits beginning shortly after those defining events. Issues of particular concern include a possible involvement of Joseph Smith with Fanny Alger during 1835 or shortly thereafter, the proposal of the Kirtland Safety Society in 1836, and its subsequent failure in 1837, the formation of the Day Knights and the dark history of war and plunder during the Far West period in 1838 and 1839, and finally, Joseph's unconscionable involvement in masonry, polygamy, and teaching that God was once a mortal man like us, and denying that God is from everlasting to everlasting. Many of these authors and historians have hinted, while others have blatantly claimed, that Joseph Smith lied and deceived people during these periods of time. Some characterized him as a hypocrite. Some accuse him of being involved in whoredoms and abominations. They accuse him of participating in priestcrafts by using his priesthood position to manipulate people and take advantage of innocent women by forcing them to do things under duress that they otherwise would never do. Some even accuse him of murder, or at least of conspiring to murder people. The amount of historical evidence compiled to make these accusations is enough to make the most ardent supporter of Joseph Smith blush. With this in mind, notice how the prophecy of Christ predicts that directly after rejecting the fullness of the gospel, the Gentiles, quote, shall be lifted up in the pride of their hearts above all nations and above all the people of the whole earth, and shall be filled with all manner of lyings and deceits and of mischiefs and all manner of hypocrisy and murders and priestcrafts and whoredoms and of secret abominations, end of quote. Provided within the above passage is a prophetic checklist that perfectly matches all the accusations leveled against Joseph Smith and his associates by critics, and even some sympathetic historians. Lying, deceits, mischiefs, hypocrisy, murders, priestcrafts, whoredoms, secret abominations. When viewed in this context provided by the biblical profile of Joseph Smith that was presented in chapter 2 of this book, I find the above prophecy to be breathtakingly astounding. The historical evidence leveled against Joseph Smith to show the iniquity in which he was involved becomes one of the most powerful and compelling proofs that he fits the biblical profile as presented. The transgression he committed, culminating in his death, brings to mind the following snippet from ancient prophecy, quote, if he commit iniquity, I will chasten him with a rod of men. 
end of quote. And then, quote, But the prophet, which shall presume to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or that shall speak in the name of other gods, even that prophet shall die, end of quote. And then, quote, If there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, and giveth thee a sign or a wonder, whereof he spake unto thee, saying, Let us go after other gods, which thou hast not known, and let us serve them, thou shalt not hearken unto the words of that prophet, or that dreamer of dreams. For the Lord your God proveth you, to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. You shall walk after the Lord your God, and fear him, and keep his commandments, and obey his voice. And ye shall serve him, and cleave unto him. And that prophet, or dreamer of dreams, shall be put to death. End of quote. I'm of the opinion that the day will come when the accusers of Joseph Smith will be racked with guilt when it dawns on them that the sins Joseph was acting out were their own sins. Sins that had artificially been placed upon Joseph the seer and his spokesman, the scapegoat. Joseph was simply burdened with the filth of the people for whom he had been laboring. When they rejected the fullness, he prevented them from being destroyed from off the face of the earth by making a, quote, reconciliation for iniquity, end of quote. Joseph Smith was a prophet of God who took upon himself the sins of apostate Israel as a result of the intercessory act of atonement that had been prophesied of in Leviticus 16. Joseph Smith, like Moses, of which he was a type, took upon himself the burden of sin of the people he loved to prolong their lives upon the earth. As a result of his intercessory atonement, the sins of apostate Israel were placed upon him, and he began acting out those sins. An intercession takes place. As previously mentioned, during the dark days of apostasy that followed after the rejection of the fullness, Joseph would establish foreign missions, announcing that something new must be done for the salvation of the church. This resulted in the gospel being taken to the house of Israel. The allegory in the book of Jacob, found in the Book of Mormon, prophesied that the Gentile church, referred to as the wild branches, would first bring forth good fruit, but then they would overrun the roots and begin to bring forth evil fruit. This is a perfect description of how the first several years of the Restoration Movement did, in fact, bring forth the Book of Mormon, the Law of the Gospel, the Saving Ordinances of the Gospel, and the priesthood authority to administer the same. Additionally, the gifts of the Spirit began to be manifest in the lives of those that accepted the Gospel with many experiencing the spiritual rebirth. Sadly, according to the allegory, the wild branches would bring begin bringing forth evil fruit and would need to be cast into the fire except we should do something for it to preserve it, end of quote. Just as the Lord of the vineyard was about to cast the Gentile church into the fire, the, quote, servant of the Lord, end of quote, intervened on behalf of the Gentile church and petitioned the Lord of the vineyard to, quote, spare it a little longer, end of quote. Happily, the Lord of the vineyard accepted the intercession of the servant and replied, quote, Yea, I will spare it a little longer, for it grieveth me that I should lose the trees of my vineyard. End of quote. And he agrees to, to do something to save the wild branches. That something would prevent the Gentile church from being cast into the fire was the grafting in of branches from the nethermost parts of the vineyard. Quote, Wherefore, let us take the branches of these which I have planted in the nethermost part of the vineyard, and let us graft them into the tree from whence they came, and let us pluck from the tree those branches whose fruit is most bitter, and graft in the natural branches of the tree in the stead thereof. And this will I do, that the tree may not perish, that, perhaps, I may preserve unto myself the roots thereof for mine own purpose. And behold, the roots of the natural branches of the tree which I planted whithersoever I would, are yet alive. Wherefore, that I may preserve them also for mine own purpose. I will take the branches of this tree, and I will graft them in unto them. Yea, I will graft in unto them the branches of their mother tree, that I may preserve the roots also unto mine own self, that when they shall be sufficiently strong, perhaps they may bring forth good fruit unto me, and I may yet have glory in the fruit of my vineyard. And it came to pass, that they took from the natural tree which had become wild, and grafted in unto the natural trees, which had also become wild, and they also took of the natural trees which had become wild, and grafted into their mother tree. End of quote. That's in Jacob 5. 
This remarkable prophecy from the Book of Mormon perfectly describes what Joseph Smith was speaking about when he said that, quote, something new must be done for the salvation of the church, end of quote. Clearly, just as Moses had offered an intercession in behalf of ancient Israel to prolong their lives on the face of the earth after they rejected the greater light, Joseph Smith also made an intercession on behalf of the apostate Gentile church, which prevented them from being destroyed from off the face of the earth. Okay, point number four. God remembers his covenant with the house of Israel. In fulfillment of the above allegory, the Lord remembers the branches in the nethermost part of the vineyard and has the gospel taken to them. It's not until after the Gentiles reject the fullness of the gospel and begin to wallow in sin that God remembers his covenant with the natural branches that the Book of Mormon refers to as the house of Israel. This is perfectly consistent with the documented events in chronological order of said events that took place in the history of the church. It's amazing that during the apostasy of the church in the Quorum of the Twelve, Joseph begins the missionary effort to the house of Israel. Number five, the Lord brings the gospel to the house of Israel. It may be significant that the Lord did not specify the Gentiles to bring the gospel to the house of Israel. Upon further scrutiny, it appears that most, if not all, of the apostles who were commissioned to cross the waters, taking the gospel to those described by Joseph Smith as the dispersed of Judah and the outcasts of Israel, were themselves actually of the house of Israel. Point number six. The house of Israel is given the knowledge of the fullness of the gospel. This amazing declaration is incredibly significant. Even though the gospel is taken to the house of Israel by the house of Israel via the authority of patriarchal priesthood, the fullness of the gospel is only taken in word, not in power. A knowledge of what the fullness of the gospel is, is contained in the scriptures brought forth by the LDS restoration. The fullness of the gospel would not be manifested in power again until the third watch. Point number seven, the Gentiles do not have power over the house of Israel. A fascinating dynamic that was taking place during the succession crisis in Nauvoo had to do with a priesthood power struggle between the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, most or all of whom were the House of Israel, and their converts from Great Britain versus the Gentile leaders of the church from the early Gentile stock, such as Sidney Rigdon and William Marks, etc. A careful study of the demographics in Kirtland and Nauvoo reveals that many of the Gentile saints from the Kirtland period had left the church before the Nauvoo period. Of those who did make it to Nauvoo, the vast majority rejected the leadership of Brigham Young and the Twelve. On the other hand, the recent converts of the House of Israel rejected the authority of Sidney Rigdon and other Gentile leaders. Ultimately, as per the prophecy in 3 Nephi 16, the Gentile leaders of the church in Nauvoo would no longer have power over the remnants of the house of Israel who followed the apostles of the house of Israel to Utah. Point number eight. If the Gentiles repent, they shall be numbered among the house of Israel. As previously documented, the Lord foretold of a future reformation that would eventually need to take place, giving the Gentile church the opportunity to repent. This revelation was given in an 1829 revelation. Quote, and thus, if the people of this generation harden not their hearts, I will work a reformation among them. And now, if this generation do harden their hearts against my word, behold, I will deliver them up unto Satan. End of quote. In 1834, the Lord revealed that both the membership of the church and its leaders were under condemnation and needed to have a reformation. Quote, Verily, condemnation resteth upon you, who are appointed to lead my church, and to be saviors of men, and also upon the church, and there must be a repentance and a reformation among you in all things. End of quote. It's not clear why it took th until the Nauvoo era for the church leadership to begin speaking about the need for the church to repent and have a reformation. The initial call for repentance in Nauvoo appears to have been the idea of William Law, who was enthusiastically supported by Hiram Smith and William Marks. Interestingly, the hot issue was that of polygamy and how it needed to be stamped out at the church. Those three leaders of the church went around in a crusade, speaking against polygamy at the various churches. Although Joseph was also publicly speaking against polygamy, he was secretly practicing it at the time, and many of the people being exposed and chastened for teaching or living it were claiming that Joseph was the secret author of the practice. William Law, Hiram Smith, and William Marks eventually discovered that Joseph was secretly teaching and living polygamy. 
The following excerpts are taken from a well-documented paper on succession by Andrew E. Hatt. Quote, Hiram Smith appeared in high council meetings to aid in this reformation of the saints. Thus, Marx, Smith, and Law were engaged in ferreting out anything that hinted at the kind of conduct which John C. Bennett was guilty. The brethren conducted this crusade in the private meetings of the high council and in public gatherings of the saints, where they preached against polygamy and kindred evils. Joseph undertook to teach the brethren and sisters, brackets the doctrine, and William Law made this expression. If an angel from heaven was to reveal to me that a man should have more than one wife, if it were in my power, I would kill him. End of quote. Hiram and William Marks were also present and agreed with William Law with what he said. In May of 1843, when Hiram Smith, William Law, and William Marks realized that their efforts had not ended the rumors of the private practice uh, to, them of, to them of parent marriage forms, they decided to bring the issue into the open. They were suspicious that their worst fears were true. Joseph was teaching plural marriage. So while Joseph was out of town, Hiram spoke on the 14th of May in the Nauvoo populace, taking as his text Jacob II in the Book of Mormon quoting the verses that are a severe denunciation of polygamy. Almost echoing William Law's sentiments, Hiram said to the saints, quote, If an angel from heaven would come and preach such doctrine, you'd be sure to see his cloven foot and cloud of blackness over his head. End of quote. Sadly, Hiram Smith was eventually converted to the practice of polygamy through the efforts of Brigham Young, who acted as an intermediary between him and his brother Joseph. When this took place, Joseph tried to redirect the focus of the church towards Hiram's authority, claiming that Hiram was the one who should conduct a reformation of the church. On July the 16th of 1843, Joseph Smith, who had resigned as the prophet of the church, stated that, quote, Hiram held the office of prophet to the church, and he was going to have a reformation, and the saints must regard Hiram, for he has authority. After the conversion of Hiram Smith to polygamy, William Law continued the crusade, and turned up the heat. Law was a convert from Canada who had migrated from Great Britain. He would continue valiantly defending the celestial marital law of monogamy as contained in the foundational law of the gospel in section 42 of the DNC.